of the Lord. So the glory of God is in his name and his person and all that he is. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the cloud because it seems that in the Old Testament in particular, clouds were always associated with God revealing himself and his glory. If we turn back to Exodus, for instance, uh, chapter 16, verse 10, we will see that this happened. And it comes to pass, as Aaron spake to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked towards the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. It is a cloud by day. And... Uh, the fire by night that identified God's presence with the children of Israel. As long as they saw the cloud over the tabernacle, they knew God was there. And when the cloud picked itself up and began to move on, then they realized that they were supposed to follow the cloud because following the cloud was following the presence of God. That's where God's presence was. And we go to Exodus chapter 40, verse 34 again. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. God's glory always seems to appear in this cloud. The glory also represents then the presence of God. The glory ushered in the presence of the living God. The cloud comes and the glory is seen and that ushers in the presence of the living God into the midst. And I want to go to, to <clears throat> the dedication of Solomon's temple. You remember Solomon had built this beautiful temple that his father David uh, God told him he could not build it because he was a man of war. And Solomon came along. David had prepared the plans, the architectural work, gathered the material and everything just about was needed to build the temple. And Solomon came along and built that beautiful temple that God had ordained and God himself had designed. And on the day of dedication, the day that the temple was dedicated. First of all, I want to read from uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. Uh, and it came to pass when the priests would come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. So it was the glory of the Lord that filled the house, that revealed the presence of God. Now in chapter 5 of Chronicles, then we have another uh, <clears throat> recording of some other things that happened during that particular celebration. Let me begin reading at verse 11 of chapter 5 of 2 Chronicles. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified and did and did not then wait by force. Also the Levites and singers of them, of Asaph, Hermon, and Gerthil, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalmers, streets and hogs, stood at the east end of the altar with them, a hundred and twenty priests recording with, uh, uh, priests sounding with trumpet. Came to pass, as the trumpeters sang, and were in one to make, were asked one 
to make one sound to be heard in praising the thanksgiving the Lord. And when they lifted up their voices with the trumpet and cymbals, <clears throat> instruments of music, and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. That then the house was filled with the cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house. I want, I want you to look at that portion just briefly with me and see what is happening there. The prerequisite to the cloud, to the glory, and the presence. You know, there's one thing that God himself respects and honors. First of all, there was the unity of the people. They were as one. There was no schisms or divisions or anything wrong uh, among the people. They were all centered their thinking, their worship on one God. And there's nothing like unity for God to work. God does not work where there are divisions, where there are grumblings and complainings, where there are people who uh, uh, have um, uh, envy or animosity against one another, or people who cannot work together in harmony, where there is jealousies, where there's all kinds of things that the Bible talks about in the New Testament in particular. There has to be a sense of unity among us. As you face another year of ministry, as you face your future and all the plans and ideas that you want to realize, one thing that God will honor is the unity of the people, that we must be in one accord. We must have the same vision. We must have the same burden. We must see the same things. And this is what happened here. They were as one, the scripture says, they were as one people, not divided. And, and then that, that was what happened there. Uh, and they all began, the scripture says, that the trumpeters and singers were as one, and they made the sound in, in the temple. And they praised the name of the Lord, saying, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. In other words, they had the same attitude towards God. They had the same feeling. They had the same understanding of who God was. I said when I read the nature and character of God back in chapter 34 of Exodus, the first thing that God said that he was merciful. And there's nowhere in the scripture where that was not uh, realized and seen more than it was with the nation of Israel. God had to be merciful to them over and over and over again. They would turn from God. They would go back uh, in the judges. They would serve God and then turn around and serve idols and so on. God was so patient. God was so merciful. God was so gracious. You see, our understanding of who God is makes a lot of difference in our life. It makes a lot of difference in our worship. Many people are angry with God. Many people don't, don't understand what has happened. You know, we don't understand today. I hear what's going on uh, of people who are dying from this virus. I heard just the other day, a young father, four in this state, four children, a pastor of a church, four children died from, and I'm saying, God, this doesn't make sense. How could we understand this? How could we understand the reverses in life? How could we understand the bad things that happen to us? How can we understand? Sometimes when we pray, when we pray, and we pray, it seems no answer is coming. 
And we begin to think God doesn't hear us. God's not listening. God has forsaken us. But they were singing in one accord, for he is good. Listen, God is good. If we don't understand anything about God, he is good. The psalmist says he is good and doeth good. I don't understand. Number three and one. A lot of things in my own personal experience. You pray and you ask and you seek and do everything you know to do. And I, I'm saying, God, you're good. But it looks like sometimes you're not good to me. And in my folly and in my thinking, I have to turn around and say, God, forgive me for the vanity of my thoughts. Because God is good whether he is good to me or not. God is good whether I experience it. See, <clears throat> what we don't understand as Christians sometimes, our personal experience has nothing to do with the character and nature of God. My personal experience cannot change who God is. If God never does anything for good for me all my life, that doesn't change the fact that He's still good. You see, we need to understand some things about God. We could pray and say, well, I don't understand why God doesn't do this and why God doesn't do that, why we can't have this and I can't. You see, all of that does nothing but bring about in our own hearts doubts and fears. But they understood that God was good. They understood that he was a merciful God. They understood he was a loving God. Many times the word mercy is translated love. It's a thing that he really, mercy is God's expression of love. And you have to understand that. And you see, when there is a unity of understanding about God, when there's a unity of understanding of the character and nature of God, and we have to trust God in spite of our feelings sometimes, in spite of our personal experiences. God is exactly who He says He is. 